Okay, so there was one aspect of Carl's fascinating talk that resonated with me personally. Um, I know that I'm not feeding the same animal here that I, I was feeding 10 or 15 years ago. So I'm definitely in need of some epigenetic strategies, I think. That's what my doctor would say. Um, so I'm here to, uh, to give you an overview of science and opportunities in relation to the uh, Department of Energy and Nanoscience facility at Oak Ridge. That's the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences, which you see here in the, in the picture. Um, so I'll move ahead fairly quickly so that we have some time for questions at the end of the session. Uh, the DOE, in response to, its, uh, to the National Nanotechnology Initiative, uh, has um, built five nanoscience research centers around the country. Uh, and this map shows you, um, if we have a mouse here somewhere, good. So this map shows you the clustering of the major DOE lab facilities. Uh, and what, you, what you'll see is that these, these purple ones here, here's the CNMS here in Oak Ridge. Uh, there is one up at Brookhaven. Uh, there's one up in Chicago here at Argonne. Uh, there's one across here on the west coast uh, at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And then there is one down here at uh, Los Alamos and Sandia. Uh, and so they've been clustered together with uh, um, a number of the other major laboratory facility, um, uh, user facilities which are supported by the DOE. So this was a deliberate strategy uh, and the idea is that each of these facilities, which you see here in the picture, uh, this is the CNMS down the bottom here, uh, and the others around the country, um, here's Argonne, up here is Brookhaven, uh, across here is the foundry at Berkeley, and then down here is uh, the SINT, so-called SINT uh, Nanoscience Center at um, Los Alamos Sandia. So they are co-located with, um, in many cases, with large light sources, and uh, in the case of Oak Ridge, we are co-located with the um, spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge. So this is a little bit of a closer up shot here which shows you uh, how this, the CNMS, which is this four level building here with the extension out the side, is uh, physically joint onto the spallation neutron source. Um, and so we work hard on cross synergizing our capabilities and activities between these two facilities. Uh, so this is where all of our offices and laboratories are <coughs> in the four story section here. And then this, uh, the one level structure out on the, build out on the side there is our clean room. So this is just a schematic of the uh, clean room. It's a 10,000 square foot uh, uh, clean room and hosts a lot of the um, environmentally sensitive uh, equipment and machinery uh, that we have with our various processes, um, various types of uh, um, uh, CVD, pulse laser, CVD, etc., cetera, um, um, electron beam milling and etching, lithography methods, they're all done here in the clean, in the clean room facility. Uh, so I'm going to talk, give you a little picture of how we fit into the DOE picture and what the strategy of the DOE is in relation to these nanoscience centers because they are different in terms of the business model that runs them compared with, for example, the large synchrotron facilities uh, and indeed the spallation neutron source next door to us. Uh, so I'll explain some of that to you to give you a, a concept of how we operate. Um, then I'll talk a bit about the different um, research capabilities and groups that we have. I'll talk a little bit about how we um, arrange our thematic in-house science uh, programs and then that'll do us. We'll close it down at that point. So as I mentioned earlier, um, these uh, um, so-called NSRCs, Nanoscience Research Centers around the country, constituted uh, the DOE's flagship response to the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which was driven also by the other major federal funding uh, agencies. Um, and uh, so the, 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 the overall parameters that you see here is that uh, these are operated as, well, as user facilities. Um, and uh, an important feature of that is that the primary operating costs are funded directly by DOE, Basic Energy Sciences, whoops. Uh, and so <coughs> um, they support research which is fundamentally um, research that can be published. We do have mechanisms for dealing with industrial collaborations where uh, the work could not be published. That goes via a separate mechanism. 
Uh, I've mentioned that we are co-located co with these large user facilities. Uh, and uh, the model that um, I'm going to tell you about was built by a broad consensus and consultation process that went on for several years. Um, the, the NNI started up, as I understand, around about uh, uh, the turn of the decade. Uh, and these, the first of these centres that was launched was, in fact, the CNMS at Oak Ridge, which got up in late 2005. So there was a long process to figure out this model. So this is quickly showing you how we fit into the kind of overall context of how the basic energy sciences of the DOE funds its different kinds of research portfolios. Uh, and what you're seeing here is three different major divisions um, within the BES programmatic portfolio. Um, over here on my left, which is also your left, good, is the Materials Science and, and Engineering Division. So these are all different types of core programs in that broad area. Across on the right, you have Chemical, Geosciences and Biosciences Division um, with uh, all individual uh, uh, projects in that sort of space over here. And down the middle here, uh, we have this thing called the Scientific User Facilities Division, which includes all of the big facilities for the synchrotrons, light sources, um, the uh, neutron scattering facility, and it also includes these uh, NSRCs, the Nanoscience Research Centres here, circled in red. Okay, uh, so that's, and so we're fit, sitting firmly in, in this division here. Um, what I should say is a very important aspect of the model that was set up for the Nanoscience Centres is that they should not just be equipment hotels where you go in with your sample, do your measurement, go home. Um, that they should be centres which have a genuinely balanced effort in their own in-house science program as well as the use of support activities. Um, and that's a very special component of the nanoscience centre business model which is different from many of the other user facilities that you see in that division. Uh, and so we're expected to maintain a world-class in-house science program um, which keeps us at the cutting edge. It drives us to develop new instrumental techniques um, that you won't find anywhere else because that's what we do. That's our specialist science area. And so we will augment. If you look across all of the nanoscience centres, all five of them, you'll see they all have basic capabilities you would expect in such a centre. Um, but then they all have their own indiv individual flavour, their own individual uh, 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 special add-ons to, to those basic capabilities that, that get driven by the in-house science program. So quickly, information about how you access it. Um, it's an open access policy, uh, and so users submit relatively short and easy to prepare proposals on the order of two to three pages. Um, these we have two calls per year uh, for these proposals. The, last, the most recent one closed a couple of weeks ago. And so we had a large feasibility analysis meeting yesterday and we're farming them out now for referees to look at. So it's a, re it's a peer review process. Um, the scores come back, the proposals get ranked, and we take as many as we possibly can uh, given our constraints of labour and equipment and, and so forth. And so typically the success rate for these proposals, if you average it across the centre, is on, in, at CNMS, it's on the order of about 60%, I would say, if you averaged it over the last four to five years. Um, in a number of the other uh, centres, it's higher, and we take that as a credit that we get a good, a really good collection of user proposals coming in, uh, and so we have a slightly lower acceptance rate at the end of the day com compared with the other centres. But it's not bad, you know, when you're used to typical funding uh, success rates of, what, 10, 20%, you have a pretty good chance. You write a good proposal. You should get this time uh, in these facilities, as long as it's technically feasible with what we've got on deck. So that's a bit about how you access uh, the centres. Um, I think I've mentioned already that that you know it's, it was always intended by the DOE that they want to leverage investments, um, exactly as as we heard earlier on from the NSF activities. All right. And so um, at Oak Ridge, we work hard on synergizing what we can do with the neutron scattering capabilities next door to us. Um, of course, Oak Ridge is, is the home of the world's largest open uh, high-performance computing facility. Uh, and we work hard and have a very strong theory team that cross-integrates with that facility. 
uh, electron microscopy is big also at Oak Ridge, um, and also we have strong overlap with, um, with that facility, which is called the SHARE User Program, if any of you are familiar with that one. Okay, um, this is just a very quick take on the um, <coughs> numbers of users that we have been able to uh, service over the past five to six years. Uh, you can see it started out around here in the early stages and, and then ramped up. It oscillates a little bit now, but we seem to be leveling out in terms of our funding base and our manpower, et cetera, um, somewhere up in the high 300s per year. Uh, there's a breakdown there in terms of academic, which is obviously the largest component, um, and so we're open to applications from any universities around the country. Um, there's also, also we're open to application from within all the different labs, national labs around the country, industry, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's a quick scope on what we're doing. We are still actually increasing the number of hours that we serve per year as we get a little more efficient at doing this whole process, but it's, it's getting pretty close to optimized um, after five or six years of, eff of very hard effort. Um, so we're also open to applications from anywhere in the world, uh, and so we have, of course, most of our uh, user projects do come from North America, but we do have them also from uh, other parts of the world there's a large concentration in Europe in particular for fairly obvious reasons. Um, so let me proceed on through there. Uh, go, 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 go. There, okay. So as I said, we also are open to application from industry. If industry are willing to publish their results, they'll go through our user program. If they have proprietary topics, then we can do that through other mechanisms. Uh, which can involve them, in a sense, directly funding a quantum of research um, to get the work done. There are also industries who are simply interested in getting a hold of the additional whistles and bells that we're putting on state-of-the-art equipment that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, so I'll mention one aspect of that uh, more, a little bit later. These guys here wanted to be able to build into their scanning probe instruments the kind of special techniques that we're developing at, at uh, the CNMS at Oak Ridge for uh, scanning probe microscopy. So let me quickly run through the groups um, that we have to give you a sense of the scope of in-house science that we run, uh, and that of course reflects uh, all of the user programs that also we are, we are um, facilitating. Uh, so we have a, a, a very strong um, imaging uh, nanoscale functionality team uh, who is, this is the surface probe microscopy people that I mentioned. Uh, we have a functional hybrid nanostructures group uh, who work on all kinds of optical and uh, electronic functionality characterization. Um, and in particular, they work on, on um, fundamental aspects of device fabrication, more fundamental than, than what Tom has been telling you about. Uh, because we're funded by BES to do that fundamental stuff, basically, and to facilitate that level of understanding. We have a, uh, a group who work, I would say, primarily on cat catalytic effects, uh, the chemical functionality team. We have a strong um, macromolecular synthetic team here. As I indicated, we have the largest theory effort amongst all of the neuroscience centers um, who interface uh, with the computational uh, directorate at, at Oak Ridge as well, are cross-matrixed. And we have the nanofab facility, and I showed you that clean room early on. Um, I had some quick eye candy slides to go through, and I'm not going to dwell a lot on these because uh, we're almost running out of time on the session. We need to have, ideally, some panel questions. So these are just some, some quick slides to give you a little flavor. Um, this one I pulled from the nanofabrication laboratory, and so these guys are really expert at, at nanopatterning uh, of arrays and channels for anything from photovoltaic, pillared architectures to uh, microfluidics, they also make structures which are uh, biomimetic in the sense that they simulate cellular function to see how much of, of the um, uh, cellular networks you can actually get functioning in an artificial structure with artificial pores and so forth. Uh, so a whole range of things that that team does. Uh, I mentioned we have a polymer synthesis uh, team who are uh, specialists in, in uh, high precision synthesis and attract a lot of users coming in. Um, uh, specifically for that skill. They also do a lot of work on driving those polymers out into photovoltaic applications, which are then characterized and measured uh, uh, together with our neutron scattering colleagues. 
Um, <clears throat> so one thing I would mention quickly is that the Polymer guys, to give you an idea of variation, their user projects are very time intensive because they've got to make this stuff and that takes time. And so their acceptance rate on proposals will typically be lower than, for example, the Surface Probe guys who can handle a project pretty quickly with less time involved. And so that does vary across our center depending on the skill base you're looking for, okay? Um, these are just a couple of uh, uh, highlight slides that you don't have time to read, I understand, but it's to give you a flavor of what the functional architecture team are doing, uh, functional hybrid nanostructures. So they will take the polymers that our polymer guys make and they will spin them down onto disks and then test them for uh, uh, electronic functionality, for photovoltaics, for uh, 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 FET devices and so on and so forth, and try to cycle back and understand some of the fundamental scientific questions. And so we really do work um, on trying to synergize these different skill bases we have, uh, because one thing that you and universities will be conscious of is that universities have a lot more labor. You have graduate students who can help drive your work, right? In the labs, we have highly qualified guys, and, and, and uh, uh, I mean guys generically, staff, I should say, right? Um, and uh, they have a lot of experience, they have tremendous equipment, so there's an amazing confluence of skills and technical and equipment capabilities in that building, but we don't have so much workforce, all right? Um, and so how can we benefit the nation and how can we drive ahead in the context of the constraints that we have, which are different from the constraints you have in the university? And one of those is synergizing across between our groups. So we don't work as individual empires, we really try to cross synergize and kick goals collaboratively between the teams. Um, and so that's really important. This is another example of a different kind of photovoltaic structure based on organic nanowires, I won't dwell on that. Um, the Nanomaterials Theory Institute, just to give you again a flavor, their desire really has been uh, from the outset to set themselves up as a key functional, what they call a nanoscience computational end station. Um, and the idea is that they will draw together components from all these different things you're seeing in order to kick new goals in science. And that's gonna ramp up, I think, rather quickly in the current, yeah, thank you, um, Nancy, in the current environment uh, of the materials genome uh, uh, initiative that's going forwards and was mentioned in one of the earlier talks. Um, our functionality guys are working a lot on catalysis efforts in relation to batteries, um, which Tom has talked about, so I'm not gonna dwell any further on that. Um, and uh, this is our Surface Probe team who uh, have really remarkable and world, unique in a worldwide context expertise uh, in scanning surfaces, both ultra high vacuum, you see all the nice shiny steel here, but also in ambient probe systems with uh, battery electrode materials with, in fluids as well. Okay, um, I'm gonna go through that. This is just illustrating how they've been able to discover um, the, the localized information about lithium ion dynamics using scanning probe tips, which could never be done uh, previously until they developed a, a, a new way of extracting information from their tips. Uh, okay, I have mentioned our science program, and I think that's gonna draw me to a close, except for the one final slide. Um, I mentioned that we do try really hard to work on cross-synergizing these groups, and so we have this matrix structure that you're seeing. Um, down on the vertical axis, you're seeing the different groups I told you about who represent capabilities, if you will, and that may be what you would want, want to focus on when you go to the website and see, well, what could I take advantage of, yeah? Um, but in terms of our own in-house science that we do, and the way that we report that up to BES, we have three overall research themes which cut across the whole set of groups. And as I said, cross synergize between them. Um, and so those are seen here on the horizontal uh, part of the table, which is the electronic and ionic functionality at the nanoscale. That's the confluence of the surface physics guys and the catalysis chemistry guys. Um, we have uh, functional polymer and hybrid architectures and assemblies, all those organic device, uh, synthetic synthesis going right out into device. And then we have collective phenomena in the nanophases, uh, which deal with the way that what we know about things on a nanoscale flows ultimately up into things that are happening in a functional way on a larger scale, uh, the mesoscale, for example. Okay, let me finish there, and um, we go to questions.